Okay, welcome everyone to today's kind of seminar. Today we're very happy to have Shu Heng Xiao from IES. Shu Heng has done a lot of uh, very interesting and important work in the context of anomalies and, and extending our understanding of symmetries in quantum field theory, um, also in the conformal bootstrap, and uh, more recently on, on fractons. Uh, and today he's going to tell us about obstructions to gapped boundaries from three manifold invariants. Take it away, Shu Heng. Thank you. Thank you, Luca, for the nice introduction. And, and thank you everyone for inviting me here uh, virtually uh, to give a talk, although I would really like to visit you Chicago physically at some point. So today I'm going to talk about an ongoing project with uh, Justin, Zohar, Kantaro, and Sahang. They're all at Stony Brook. And um, it's about obstructions to gap boundary from three manifold invariant. So let me get started. And please feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have any question. Okay, so, um, so this talk will mainly about topological quantum field theory or TQFT in two plus one dimensions. And this has been an active research topic in high energy physics and also in condensed matter physics and also in mathematics for a very long time. It includes the famous transignment theory and also various finite group gauge theory. And more specifically has applications in two-dimensional conformal field theory, topological orders, and knot theory in mathematics. And in all this context, it's quite common to study a two plus one D top topological quantum field theory on a three manifold with a one plus one D boundary. This appears in the context of Transimon's West Lumino Witten uh, correspondence, or in the condensed matter context, it appears in quantum Hall effects. Generally, if you are given a 2 plus 1D TQFT, there can be all kinds of boundary that you can build up. Given any boundary, you can always stack a well defined 1 plus 1D quantum field theory on top of it. And that makes another boundary. It might not be the most natural thing to do in a lab, but it's certainly a consistent setup. So the right question is never to ask what is the boundary of a two plus one DTQFT. There could be all kinds of boundaries. But a particularly simple boundary condition is a trivially gapped boundary. Namely, it's a boundary where there's no uh, propagating degrees of freedom. From a more mathematical point of view, it corresponds to a topological boundary condition. Sorry, Chuang, usually, in, at least when we're not talking about boundary conditions, we distinguish between gapped and trivially gapped. Yes. Yeah. So, so in, in this talk, I will not put in any symmetry. So I will not impose any symmetry. And I, I will focus on trivially gapped boundary. So I'll probably just say gap. When we impose symmetries, yes, you are right. Then we can talk about boundary condition preserving the symmetry of the trivially gap or those with the symmetry broken. But that will be a follow up project after. So, the, the, the main question that uh, we would like to discuss today is that given a 2 plus 1 DTQFT, does it emit such a gap boundary? And as Clay already asked, um, and, and let me just say again, uh, in, in, in this talk, I'm not going to impose any global symmetry. And for simplicity, I'm going to restrict myself to bosonic TQFTs. So these are TQFTs, uh, which, does not, which do not require a choice of the spin structure on my three manifold. Generally, a two plus one D bosonic TQFT may not emit a gap boundary in, in this case, the boundary is forced to have gapless edge modes. And these gapless edge modes are not protected by conventional anomalies, and they're not protected by symmetry either. And this, they, they arise uh, intrinsically because of the non-trivial um, topological nature of the bulk TQFT. But before I go into any details, let me just give two quick examples. The first one is the U1 and level 2N transignment theory. I put a factor of two just because um, I'm only going to focus on bosonic 
transignment theory. When the level is odd, this transignment theory is fermionic or is spin, in other words, and we need to specify the spin structure. So U1 and level two and transignment theory, uh, whose Lagrangian is given as this, the ordinary ADA, it does not admit any gap boundary. This boundary, for example, can be the chiral boson CFD, uh, which is one of the simplest types of gapless edge modes. Another example is the two plus one dimensional ZN gauge theory, which is the low energy limit of the ZN Tori code. The Lagrangian is given by this, written in terms of two gauge fields, A and B. They're both one form gauge fields. The ZN gauge theory, on the other hand, does admit uh, gap boundary conditions. So these are just two examples where one admits a gap boundary and the other does not. So the more specific question uh, we would like to ask uh, is what are the sufficient and necessary conditions for two plus one D bosonic TQFT to have a gap boundary? It's a very old question and with many, many interesting results in the literature, including uh, people in the audience. Uh, in particular, there's a very nice paper by Michael uh, back in 2013, explaining these conditions for abelian TQFT in terms of uh, the anion data. I should say this question has been um, solved uh, to in many from from many different aspects completely in all these references I briefly alluded to here. But today we will build on this old result and derive new ones. And the, our new result, um, even though it's built on the earlier ones. Uh, I think in many ways are practically uh, easier for certain kinds of questions. So uh, before everyone decouple, let me just state the main result uh, uh, briefly here. So in this work, we find infinitely many new obstructions to a two plus one D bosonic TQFT admitting a gap boundary. These new obstructions, each labeled by a closed three manifold arise from the faces of the partition functions of the TQFT on this three manifold. If the phase is non-trivial, this non-trivial phase presents an obstruction to the gap boundary. So if the phase is non-trivial, the TQFT cannot have a gap boundary. And as I emphasized uh, in the previous slide, all these obstructions uh, many, of, uh, many of them, if not all, can be explicitly written in terms of the SNT matrices of the TQFT, and they are highly computable. So is the, is the boundary theory anomalous in general or uh, non-anomalous in this case? So um, in the case when the TQFT uh, does not emit a gap boundary, then it's forced to have a gapless edge such as the chiral boson CFD that I briefly alluded to here. In this case, the boundary one plus one D theory is not a well-defined one plus one D theory on its own right. And it requires a bulk for the whole 2D, 3D system to make sense. In some, in some terminology, people call it a relative theory instead of an absolute theory uh, by itself. In that sense, you can call it an anomalous. But I think the word anomaly has been heavily abused in both high energy physics and condensed matter. So I think um, it's better to, uh, yeah. And I think the precise meaning uh, is, is what I just said. So if you, so if you had a theory with um, one left moving chiral boson and one right moving chiral boson from two decoupled transignments, would that still fall into the same category, even though the boundary theory is well-defined? In, in that particular, if you have both the left moving and the right moving, and they say say they pair up in a nice way, that could be a one plus well defined one plus one d uh, system on its own right. But that example, of course, admits uh, gapping deformation. That's correct. Yeah. So in that case, you don't really need a bulk, and uh, whatever bulk it can be coupled to does not uh, is not forced to have a gapless boundary. Mm -hmm. But the perspective from the, of this talk will be more from the bulk uh, than from the boundary. So we start with the bulk 
and we ask what kind of gap boundary can you, uh, does he admit a gap boundary or not? Does that address the question, Sal? Uh-huh, yeah, that's, okay. that's great, thanks. Yeah, thank you. All right, so the outline of the talk is given as follow. The first part is completely basic. I'm just going to give some, uh, review some basic data of two plus one DTQFT. The second part will be about abelian TQFT where I can state the proof of the main result very clearly and carefully. And the third part will be about non-abelian TQFT where I'm going to skip some details of the argument but present the final uh, result. And as you can already see from the outline, there's a very interesting relation uh, or con uh, interplay between uh, the TQFT we are addressing and various different kinds of three manifolds. So let's start with a quick review about of two, B, two plus one D TQFT. So in a two plus one, TQ, one D TQFT, the only local operator is the identity operator. So if you are a physicist who only cares about local operator, it's completely boring. There's no interesting correlation function of local operators for the two plus one D TQFT on a closed three manifold. However, there are uh, many interesting topological line operators. So these are extended observables. Uh, and by line, I mean there are line operators in the uh, two plus one dimensional space time. For example, these line operators can be the Wilson lines in transignment theory. The adjective topological means that in any observable or correlation functions of the line operators, if you deform the locus of the line a little bit without changing its topological class, you don't change the correlation function. From the condensed matter point of view, this line op sorry, this line operators in space-time are the war lines of the microscopic anion excitations. In the UV microscopic system, we have anions as finite energy states in our Hilbert space. When we flow to the low energy two topological quantum field theory, they become defects uh, and they are represented by this topological line operators. And we will reduce um, some, but not all the basic properties of general two plus one D TQFT. And this will pave the way for, uh, for our main theorem um, of gap, about gap boundaries. And I should emphasize that for this talk, I'm only going to make statement about two plus one dimensional TQFT uh, by itself. I'm not going to make statement for the microscopic UV lattice model. Um, so, I mean, logically, although most of, most if not all the robust topological phases in two plus one D are described by two plus one D TQFT, um, here, I'm not going to use that assumption or make that assumption. I'm just going to make a statement about TQFT and its gap boundary. So the most basic data in the two plus one D TQFT is the fusion between the anions. The two anions, uh, say one labeled by A, the other labeled by B, can be fused together. And on the right-hand side, there's generally a superpositions of different anions C with some non-negative integers n, that's the fusion coefficient. And anion A is called abelian if its fusion with an arbitrary anion B contains a single anion on the right-hand side, namely if it takes this form. A TQFT with only abelian anions is, in, is called an abelian TQFT. The second data is the topological spin, or sometimes just the spin of an anion. If you twist the anion like this in the figure, then it generally generates a phase with theta of A. Uh, the theta of A is an element U1. Sometimes we will also uh, write it as e to the two pi i h, where h is defined modulo an integer. And this is called the spin uh, of the anion. Uh, third, to any two plus one D bosonic TQFT, there's a pair of S and T matrices for a representation of the modular group SL2Z. The S matrix encodes the braiding data between two anions. 
pictorically, you can have an anion A uh, link, uh, circling around an anion B, and then you can try to shrink this anion A. Uh, as, we, as I said earlier, everything is topological. So as I shrink this anion, I can make it smaller and smaller, and eventually it will uh, just disappear, but at the price of producing some factor here, given by the ratio of the S matrix. And this is the braiding phase between the anion A and the anion B. There's also a T matrix, which is uh, defined in terms of the spin of the anion, and it's a diagonal matrix. And notice that here I define the T matrix without the shift by the minus C over 24. This convention is sometimes more convenient in 2 plus 1 dt 2 ft where the other co convention, including the minus C over 24, is more conventional in two, two, uh, 1 plus 1 conformal field theory. So these are uh, some of the basic data of the He froze, right? Or was it just yeah. me? No, he froze. Still, is he still on the meeting? Um, I think he's still on the meeting. <laughs> oh, he's gone now. I guess he'll come back. This is the second week in a row we're having trouble with our Zoom. And they don't know if it's, a, it's on a land or if it's a... Well, it's starting to be a pattern. All right, well, let's thank Shuheng for a great talk. Very good, next week. The rest of our Zoom seems to be working because everybody else is on. Yes, but there might be some bug with screen sharing. Mm. I've had some bugs recently with screen sharing in Zoom. Yeah, me too, with the updates. Yeah. Um, Sorry, somehow I was disconnected. <laughs> I think there was some problem with the IAS. Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Share my screen again. So, uh, where where was I uh, before I disconnected? You were on this slide. Yeah, right? You finished this slide. Okay, great. So, yeah, I didn't talk to to the vacuum for too long. Okay, so now let's move on to the chiral central charge, which, which is another very important piece of data that we are going to use. The chiral central charge C minus of a 2 plus 1 dTQFT captures the perturbative gravitational anomalies of the boundary edge mode. Therefore, if C minus is non zero, the TQFT does not emit a gap boundary. There has to be something on the boundary to saturate this perturbative gravitational anomaly. And therefore, this is the first obstruction to a gap boundary. Whenever someone hands you a 2 plus 1 dt QFT, the first thing you check is this uh, chiral central charge. If it's non-zero, then uh, there's no way you can have a gap boundary, and that's the end of the story. If C minus is non-zero, but it's zero mod A, then we can stack an appropriate power of some invertible QFT, such as the EA that level one Simon theory to cancel this gravitational anomaly. From a high energy quantum field theory point of view, this is some UV counter turns we are allowed to add. So I will always allow myself to work modulo such invertible Q QFTs. So while C minus equals to zero modulo eight is a necessary condition for gap boundary, it's not sufficient. Many C minus equals to zero modulo eight TQFT, such as this one, U1 level two times U1 level minus four, do not emit a gap boundary. 
And as I said, this gapless edge are then not protected by any ordinary symmetries or anomalies. So we will henceforth assume C minus is zero mod A. Otherwise, there's no gap boundary, end of story. So I'm going to make this assumption from now on. In this case, there's a scheme for the two plus one in TQFT in which the TQFT partition function is topological and it's also independent of the choice of the framing of the three manifold. In the math language, the partition function uh, is, then is then identical to the RT invariant. All right, so that concludes the, the quick review about two plus one D TQFT. And now I'm, move on, I'm moving on to, to, um, to, to abelian TQFT and lens spaces. So for simplicity, let me start with abelian TQFTs. Every abelian TQFT can be described by an abelian transignment theory. So for, for this class of theory, there's really no loss of generality by thinking about it as U1 to the sum power transignment theory with a specific K matrix. In this case, all the anions are abelian and the fusion of the anions forms a group. Generally, the fusion of the anions is not a group because there are more than one, there are generally more than one turns in the On just happen again. So this time I'm doing something different. Now I'm using my personal hotspot on my phone to, to connect to Zoom. Sorry about that again. Just five minutes before my talk, I noticed that there's something weird on this internet. Okay, I hope it, I won't be cut off again. So can everyone hear me now? We can hear oh, you, no. now you're a bit laggy, probably because of the phone. Um, Let's see. So there's your Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you. You're are you still on your phone? I'm on, on my phone now. Yeah, I it's, changed a, my phone. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. it's a bit laggy, I think, because of the phone. Maybe stop sharing your video. You share your okay. screen. Okay, I hope you guys still remember what I look like. Okay, I stopped my video. So is it working properly now? You can you hear me fine? Yes, yes, we hear you. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. And hopefully it won't happen again. <laughs> All right. So I think I was here. Yeah, so the anions in, in the 2 plus 1D TQFT, they generate a one form global symmetry of the abelian TQFT. So recall that one form symmetry in 2 plus 1D are gender, their symmetry operators are lines. And the lines are precisely the anion lines. In this high energy language, gauging a one form symmetry in a 2 plus 1D bosonic TQFT is equivalent to condensing the corresponding anions in the condensed matter language. As usual, for any global symmetry, we can discuss is to hoof anomaly. And the to hoof anomaly means that there's an obstruction to gauging that one form symmetry. In the case of um, the one form symmetry in 2 plus 1D, the obstruction is captured by the spins of the anions. In particular, the one form symmetry generated by the bosons, namely, namely those anion lines whose topological spin is trivial in plus one, are free of to hoof anomaly. In this high energy language, in terms of the one form symmetry, the classic result in this references on the gap boundaries can be phrased as follows. An abelian TQFT has a gap boundary if and only if there's a non-anomalous one form symmetry subgroup of the total one form symmetry group 
uh, whose order square is the total group order. We can take it from here and show that if you gauge this uh, subgroup L, the TQFT becomes a trivial TQFT. In the condensed matter language, this is known as condensing a Lagrangian subgroup L of anion. A Lagrangian subgroup um, is a non-anomalous one-point symmetry subgroup such that the order obey this condition. Roughly speaking, you can think about this condition arising as follows. You have a abelian transignment theory given by a K matrix. You want to specify a boundary condition by setting some of the gauge fields to zero. But you, as always, uh, to have a good variational principle, you should only set half of them to half of the variables in your phase space to zero. And choosing which half corresponds to choosing a Lagrangian subgroup here. And now we can state our uh, main so train, I, Sorry, can you go back to the, um, yeah. in, in that sort of more standard way of thinking about the boundary condition, why is it important that the lines are bosonic? How do you see that, if that condition creep in from the choosing a Lagrangian field subspace? Yeah, I think otherwise they will not pair up nicely with each other. You mean so, this, this, the spin is in the kinetic term, basically? Yes, exactly. The spins are equal to the Yeah, okay. So now we can get to state our main uh, result. So let z of g comma m be the partition function of the abelian TQFT g on a closed three manifold m. Notice that M is a closed three manifold, even, the whole, even though the whole talk is about boundary condition. And we will show that an abelian TQFT with C minus equals to zero modulo eight has a gap boundary only if its partition function on a, manifold, on a three manifold M is positive for any manifold obeying this condition. So you start with the TQFT G, you look for, look for closed three manifold whose um, first homology group obeys this GCD condition with the one form symmetry group. And if it has a gap boundary, then it's necessarily true that its partition function has to be positive. So, so far, I'm just stating the result. Later on, I'm going to give some intuition and proof. So here I'll just copy the theorem again. And let me give a very quick proof, which is um, really simple. So as I said, from uh, the earlier result, um, starting by Kapusin and Solina, we know that an abelian TQFT has a gap boundary if and only if we can gauge a non-anomalous one point symmetry subgroup with L squared equals to G to obtain a trivial theory. Let me rephrase this sentence in equation. A trivial theory has partition function one. This is the partition function of the original TQFT G coupled to the one form symmetry background field A. So this capital A, you can think about it as a two form L gauge field. And I'm summing over A, meaning that I'm gauging this symmetry. I'm promoting the uh, uh, gauge field to dynamical. These are some positive normalization factor from gauging a one form symmetry in two plus one D. And the statement that gauging this Lagrangian subgroup L of the abelian TQFT gives you a trivial theory means that the final answer is one. Uh, so recall that in our theorem, there's a conditions on the GCD between the one form symmetry group and the first homology group of the manifold. It's easy to show that if this condition is satisfied, uh, th that this condition is satisfied if and only if this cohomology group on um, this manifold with G coefficient vanishes. This H upper two is precisely the group, the cohomology group, where our two form gauge fields live in. Therefore, if this condition is satisfied, there is simply no non-trivial gauge fields on such three manifolds. And therefore, gauging such two uh, one form symmetry is completely trivial. So there's no sum. 
there's just one term. Then it, this H1, you can show to be one. H0 just give you L, bring that to the other side. We conclude that the partition function has to be one over the order of L. And in particular, this is a positive number and hence the proof. Shu Hang, is, is there secretly some kind of state whose norm you're computing being, being constructed here? Let me see. I think if you make some cut, then you can interpret it that way. But I'm not using that interpretation here. Yeah, that's a good question, but we are not using that interpretation. It might very well be the case. I'm almost certain there is such an interpretation. All right, so here I'm just writing that theorem again. And abelian TQFT has a gap boundary only if the partition, this partition function is positive for any manifold obeying this GCD condition. This GCD condition really uh, sees the TQFT data as well as the three manifold data. So we should look for some simple three manifold with finite first homology group. The first that will come to anyone's mind is the lens space. The lens space is the three sphere quotient by a ZN group. And its first homology group is just ZN. So now um, for, N, for an abelian TQFT, we should choose the N here labeling the lens space such that GCD G comma N is one. The lens space partition function for an abelian TQFT can be easily computed. You can, um, computed uh, by gluing two solid torus together uh, or equivalently using surgery. In any case, the final answer is given as follow. It's written in terms of the S and T matrices of the TQFT. And um, it, it can be further simplified as a sum over the anion spin raised to the certain power. We would like this quantity to be positive, so let's write its phase more explicitly where the power n is the, uh, is the n for the lens space. This quantity is known as the higher central charges uh, for T TQFT. And it has been discussed in this two uh, relatively recent math papers where they show um, from a mathematical point of view why the higher central charges are obstructions to gap boundaries of TQFTs. Notice that if you put little n to be one, uh, it reduces to this expression. And it is a well-known fact in two plus one TQFT that the higher central charge modulo eight can be derived from the anion data. So this is really a natural generalization of the ordinary chiral central charge. Can I ask, so in, in the case of the chiral central charge, if I pick a gapless boundary, then I can observe the chiral central charge in a local correlation function. Yes. Is there a similar statement about the higher central charge? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. How, we haven't thought about that. I don't know how to think about, I don't even know how to think about it in terms of anomaly. I don't know if it even admits such an interpretation. Well, not, not as an anomaly. Yeah. I mean, just as like, is it a piece of a correlation function? Like that's one yeah. of the fastest way to see the chiral central charge right. in quantum capitalists right. is giving you right. power decay of correlators. Right. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. We definitely don't have any interpretations in terms of anomalies. And as you, yeah, as you say, I mean, in terms of, for the ordinary central chart, it is an anomaly, and it is an anomaly such that it, it, it is captured by, uh, by the local uh, correlation function. For this one, I, I don't really know. Yeah. So the theorem proven by these mathematicians is that an abelian bosonic TQFT has a gap boundary only if these higher central charges are all trivial. And notice that there's a restriction on the little n and the order of the abelian TQFT. And this arise from um, the argument of the proof that we gave, which is different from their math proof. I should also say that their theorem applies to non-abelian TQFTs as well, but the formula needs to be slightly uh, general. We have a slightly bonus improved result on this which is that, and a bit, so their result is only in one direction. So these are some 
um, some necessary condition for the, uh, 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 these are some obstruction to the gap boundary, but having trivial higher central charges do not necessarily guarantee the bosonic TQFT to, uh, to have a gap boundary. In fact, they, in this math paper, they computed the, uh, some counter examples. Uh, but we are able to slightly extend the range of the little n uh, such that we can show that an abelian bosonic TQFT has a gap under if and only if all these quantities are trivial. So does the remark mean that you, you explicitly construct the Lagrangian subgroup given this by thinking of it in terms of some elementary abelian TQFTs? So yes, so we did use the, so in order to derive this result, we did use the uh, previous result on the Lagrangian subgroup. So this, I think this conceptually might not be uh, anything significant, but pr pr practically it's actually a big improvement. So someone, if someone now just hands you a billion TQFT, then you don't really have to look for a Lagrangian subgroup. All you have to do is to compute uh, this, this quantity could see n, and there are only finitely many little n you have to compute when uh, n has periodicity, the older g. So there are really just a finitely many numbers that you compute, and if there are O plus one, that means uh, it necessarily, the TQFT necessarily has a gap boundary. But as I should emphasize, this uh, logically follows from the previous condition that was known in the literature that gap on, that there's a gap boundary if and only if there's a Lagrangian subgroup. All right. So let me do an example just to give some intuition. Let's consider um, u1 level two n1 times u1 level minus two n2. So as we already said, if you just take one u1 at some, at some level, that has c minus equals to one. It has non-trivial chiral central charge. Therefore, it definitely cannot have a gap boundary. End of story. To cancel that chiral central charge, what we can do is to put another factor with a negative level. Then the chiral central charge is zero. Then you can ask, does it have a gap boundary? The one point symmetry group is Z2N1 and Z2N2. So the question is, what are the conditions on N1 and N2 such that this TQFT emits a gap boundary? It's easy to see that from the definition of the Lagrangian subgroup that there is a Lagrangian subgroup if and only if n1 times n2 is a perfect square because you want L squared to be the order of G and the order of G is for n1 n2. Let's go ahead uh, and compute the higher central charges for this TQFT. It ends up being the Jacobi symbol uh, of n1 times n2 over n. And don't worry too much if you forget uh, what the Jacobi symbol is. I, I didn't remember when I started this project, but I just blindly compute this quantity and, and find that it, it can be written as follows. And therefore, I, I, I was curious to ask if the condition that n1, n2 is a perfect square, what does that have to do with the Jacobi symbols being trivial. So I sent an email to my collaborator, Sahang. I, I told them, I, asked, uh, I used Mathematica to check that it seems that a positive integer is a perfect square if and only if uh, all the Jacobi symbols are plus one for a prime number n. And I can show one direction, which is very simple. And maybe two hours later, he immediately sent me a proof proving the other direction. The proof is not trivial and involves a lot of Ch Chinese remainder theorem of modulo A to modulo 5, but it ends up being true. And I was really surprised and I asked, uh, how, how did you come up with such a proof so quickly? And then someone told me that it's actually, it, it's actually one of the standard IMO question they train their students for. And Sahan ha happens to have participated in IMO before, so that's why he can solve this problem really quickly. So the upshot is that there's a math fact that a positive integer n is a perfect square if all its Jacobi symbols are trivial. In this case, all these Jacobi symbols are precisely the higher central charges. In this particular case, they provide an if and only if condition uh, for the theory to emit a gap boundary. All right, so that was the abelian story. 
And now uh, let me move to the more interesting non-ability actors story. So for general non-abelian TQFT, let's define this quantity, the Frobenius Schur exponent, it has a scary name, but it's defined in a really simple way. It's just the smallest integer such that the annual spin raised to this power is plus one for, for every annual. And uh, you can think about it as the analog of the order of the one-form symmetry group G in the case of an abelian TQFT. So this is the slight generalization we will need for going to the abelian TQFT. On the geometry side, uh, we will uh, have to use the fundamental group instead of the homology group for the three manifold. And recall that the abelianization of the fundamental group is precisely the homology group. And then we can generalize our theorem. So this is the theorem for the abelian case where the partition, some partition function has to be positive if the manifold and the TQFT obey this GCD condition. And we can generalize it to non-abelian TQFT if you replace the order of the one point symmetry group by this Frobenius sure exponent, and if you replace the homology group by the fundamental group. Let me just copy that here and again. To apply the theorem in its mo most naive form, we look for three manifolds with finite fundamental group. In fact, this condition can be relaxed, but I will not uh, say anything about that in this talk. One special class of uh, three manifolds with finite fundamental groups are the spherical three manifolds. These are generalization of length spaces where you quotient the three sphere uh, by a sub finite subgroup of S SO4 gamma that acts freely on S3. Such spherical three manifolds has fundamental group given, given by this gamma finite group. In fact, uh, Paradigma should show that all compact three manifolds with finite fundamental groups are spherical manifolds. And this statement, uh, a corollary of this statement is actually what proves the Poincaré conjecture. If you look uh, on wiki, spherical three manifold have an ADE classification, uh, which I will say briefly in the next slide. So now given a general non-abelian TQFT C, all we have to do is to look for spherical three manifold such that this GCD condition is one. Then the partition function, the phase of the partition function on such a manifold give an obstruction to gap boundaries of this non-abelian TQFTC. The spherical three manifolds have this ADE classification. So you first pick an ADE algebra, Lie algebra, and then there's an additional integer M that you have to pick. The A series are the length spaces. There's an EA type spherical three manifold where the first uh, first one in the series is the famous Poincaré homology sphere. And here I recorded the order of the fi uh, fundamental group. So given a TQFT with some Frobenius Schur exponent, you look for a spherical three manifold such that this GCD condition is satisfied. Okay, so now I have stated the theorem and I have uh, given you a large class of three manifolds that you can apply the theorem with. And now let's try to apply this um, machinery to some physics question. But that very natural question you can ask is that, suppose I just throw you a TQFT. Maybe it's C minus is non-zero. And then it's, since it's C minus is not zero, it does not emit a gap boundary, end of story. But maybe you can ask, oh, what if I stack two of them, three of them, four of them? Maybe I stack sufficiently many of them. There might be a gap boundary for the stack system. There's a fact proven by a mathematician uh, more than a decade ago. If you take any abelian bosonic TQFT, any one of them, then eight copies of that abelian bosonic TQFT always has a gap boundary. 
However, oh, let me just make one quick comment. Any abelian TQFT can be represented by an abelian transignment. So it's chiral central charge is always an integer. So if you take eight times of them, at least the chiral central charge is a multiple of eight. So that at least passes the first obstruction. What's but, more than true? Sorry, the, the higher central charges that you, you introduced before, is it for the abelian case, is it clear that they're mod eight? Uh, it's not clear, but you can you can show that. And so that we we, we I should view them as integers mod eight or something like that. For abelian TQFT, you can show that is indeed the case, but it's slightly non-trivial to do that. And we 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 will do that. We actually have a little computation in our draft showing that. But for more general non-abelian TQFT, that's not the case. So or maybe I should just add one more comment. So for more general non-abelian TQFT, the higher central charges are also defined as the phase of the TQFT partition functions on lens spaces. But this fact is not true for non-abelian TQFT. And so let's consider the simplest non-abelian TQFT, which is known as the Fibonacci anion. Maybe from a high energy point of view, it's more naturally uh, known as the G2 at level one transignment theory. The G2 sounds scary, but the anion data is really extremely simple and it really qualifies as the simplest non abelian TQFT. You only have two anions the trivial one and a unique non trivial anion with spin given by this. Uh, note that there's a five here, so the Frobenius shear exponent is five. It's the smallest integer such that theta two, this power is one. The chiral central charge is 14 over five. And the fusion is given by uh, tau times tau equals to one plus tau. Since the chiral central charge is non-zero, it cannot possibly emit a gap boundary. Okay, but what about, what if we take 20 copies of them? 20 copies of the G2 at level one transignment theory, its central charge is zero mod A. So it has a slight chance of emitting a gap boundary, but does it? Again, it's a fact proven by mathematicians almost a decade ago, or more than a decade ago, that no power of the Fibonacci anion emits a gap boundary. Now, how do we detect this obstruction from our uh, invariant? We need an irrational phase from the partition function to do the job. So the phase of the part TQFT partition function, of course, just um, multiply as you stack many copies of them. In order to show that no power of the Fibonacci anion emits a gap boundary, it better be the case that, well, it, uh, it would be great if it's the case that we get an irrational phase from our computation, then it really shows that it cannot, no power of it emits a gap boundary. Now, uh, it's, this comment is, is related to Clay's earlier question. The higher central charges, uh, namely th those obstructions obtained from lens spaces for abelian and non-abelian TQFT are shown to always to be a root of unity. This, this was shown in this paper. So the lens spaces are not good enough to detect this uh, uh, infinite obstruction. So we need to look for other th spherical free manifolds. It turns out that one, the, one of the E6 type spherical three manifold has uh, this pi one, the pi one, uh, the order of pi one is 24. And since five is co-prime to 24, the phase of the partition function on this E6 manifold is an obstruction to gap boundary. Now we can use the surgery formula to compute the partition function of the Fibonacci anion on this E6 type closed spherical three manifold. It's given by this in terms of the SMT matrices. And for Fibonacci anion, the SMTs are really just some two by two uh, matrices. So you can easily compute this variable. And you find that for 20 copies of the Fibonacci anion, so let me just remind you where this 20 comes from. Uh, a single copy of the Fibonacci anion has C equals to 14 over five. Since it's C is non-zero, there's no chance it has a gap boundary. 
if we take 20 copies of them, it sees a multiple of eight, and then it has a chance to have a gap boundary. So that's why we look into it. This partition function is given by this weird um, quantity. It's not real, among other things. It has a complex number here. You can show that this phase is irrational. And therefore, no power of the Fibonacci anion emits a gap boundary. So we use the E6 type spherical three manifold to give a very simple proof why the Fibonacci anion, uh, why no power of the Fibonacci anion emit a gap boundary. All right, so let me just summarize my, my, my talk. Uh, so we, we prove a general theorem that let's see be a bosonic TQFT, abelian or non-abelian, with C minus equals to zero mod A. It has a gap boundary only if its partition function is positive on those manifolds obeying this GCD condition. Here, let me remind you the Fubinius Schur exponent NFS is the smallest integer such that uh, if you, uh, that theta to the n is one for all anions. The faces of this partition function are obstructions to gap boundaries. And this higher obstruction, they do not arise from ordinary global symmetries or, or nodes. And it would be interesting to understand it from uh, maybe generalizing some notions of symmetries or anomalies, or maybe hopefully, as Clay suggested, to see that from some boundary data. But we haven't made uh, any significant progress in those directions. And in particular, uh, we can choose the spherical three manifold, which has a uh, ADE classification to give infinitely many such obstructions. But I should also emphasize that we have a slight generalization of the theorem, which does not rely on having a finite fundamental group. But I, I will not discuss it today. There's a bonus result uh, coming from this discussion for abelian TQFT. So it has been long for decades, for decades, that an abelian TQFT has a gap boundary if and only if it has a Lagrangian subgroup. Let me remind you from the high energy point of view, the Lagrangian subgroup is a non-anomalous one-point symmetry subgroup whose order square is the total one-point symmetry group order. But we can repackage this if and only if condition as the uh, positivity of this higher central charges for little n run in this very funny range. In practice, there are only finitely many little n you have to check the positivity of uh, because this quantity is periodic by sh shifting little n by this capital N. So it's really a very highly computable uh, cri criteria for you to detect uh, whether uh, abelian TQFT has a cap boundary or not. Let me just also make a quick comment, which already exists in the literature in one form or another is that when you think about the Lagrangian subgroup as a non-anomalous one-point symmetry uh, group, it immediately leads you to the conclusion that an abelian TQFT has a gap boundary if and only if the abelian TQFT is a digraph witten theory, namely if and only if it's a abelian finite group gauge theory, possibly with a digraph witten twist. All right, so let me just end with this uh, uh, flow chart. So in case you ever wonder if TQFT has a gap boundary, the first thing you check is its chiral central charge. If the chiral central charge uh, does not, it's not a multiple of eight, then end of story. If it's a multiple of eight, you can go ahead to check these new obstructions that we found. And if any of them is not a positive number, then there's not going to be a gap. Uh, but all these obstructions uh, might not provide a sufficient condition for the most general TQFT, and that's still something we are thinking about. All right, so despite all the internet uh, disruption, I'm still right on time, so thank you. All right, thanks, Shun. Let's thank Shun for the nice talk. Um, and we can take uh, a few questions. So what about a converse in the non-abelian case? Yep, uh, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. So actually, to be fair, let me start with the abelian case. 
So for the billing case, we have this bonus result, right? Where we have a complete characterization for the obstructions by running this little n over this whole ranges, whole, whole range. But some of them are not, do not satisfy the condition, um, the, the GCD condition we outline. So already for the abelian case, um, the higher central charges defined by mathematicians do not give a complete characterization of the obstructions. And in fact, in, the, in that case, uh, the, it, it's known in uh, what are exactly the counterexamples. So they have complete control over the counterexamples. And that's what renders us to be able to, uh, to, to fill in the gap and extend the range of little n. For the non-abelian case, uh, so far, we, if, okay, for a non-abelian case, if you allow, okay, for the non-abelian case, so far we don't have an example where these obstructions cannot do the job, but we also don't have a proof. The most challenging, um, the, the most difficult challenge used to be the Fibonacci anion, because that really requires us to find the irrational phase, but we did eventually. So far, we don't really have a counterexample, but we are still uh, looking into that. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So um, can you say a little bit about why, um, why one would expect that if this partition function is positive, uh, let's see. No, it's the other way around. If it's neg if it's not positive, then you don't have a gap boundary. I, I thought at the beginning, if I understood correctly, you gave a kind of derivation in the abelian case right. by right. relating it to another criterion. But is there a direct way to see it? In particular, can one see it in the non-abelian case? Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I think for the abelian case, the proof was basically that was basically that. For such manifolds, uh, gauging is completely trivial. Uh, okay, let me rewind. For, for the abelian case, an abelian TQFT has a gap boundary if and only if one can find such a Lagrangian subgroup, such that if you gauge it, you get a trivial theory. So that means the original abelian TQFT partition function has to be related to the trivial plus one up here in some way. And the precise way that they are related is given by this. And what we added to the story is just that for those manifolds obeying such a conditions, this whole sum becomes trivial. And, and we find that gauging is trivial and therefore the partition function of the abelian TQFT has to have the same phase as the trivial partition function. It has to have the same phase, phase as the partition function for a trivial TQFT. And therefore, they have to be both positive. Now, you are right that this reasoning doesn't extend to the non-abelian case, which I intentionally gloss over during my talk. So now I'm going to do justice to that by giving you some vague argument, which we work out more explicitly in the draft that we're still working on. But let me just give you a, 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 a rough intuition. The rough intuition, so the obvious question is that for non-abelian TQFT, then there's one has to generalize appropriately what we mean by gauging a one-form symmetry in this context, because the non-abelian, the anions that we might need to condense might be non-abelian anions. In the condensed matter literature, there has been a lot of discussions about non-abelian anions condensation. And from a more high energy point of view, that means we insert all these non-abelian anions lines on our three manifolds. One way to think about the superpositions of these non-abelian anion lines is the following. So let's start with the non-abelian TQFT and assume it has a gap boundary. Then in my three manifold, I can drill out an empty tube with nothing inside. Right, because the TQFT has a gap boundary. So I can, I can impose such gap boundary on the, on, on, the, on, on the boundary of the empty tube. So my three manifold has two, uh, 
two sides. One is the torus inside the empty tube. The other is the outside. And this empty tube defines a superposition of animals. Engaging them means that we wrap these empty tubes around uh, to form a fine mesh in our three manifolds. And the fact that it, uh, uh, it has a gap boundary means that we, uh, the partition function is plus one when we, um, uh, when we insert this fine mesh. But on the other hand, we can enlarge this fine mesh of empty tubes so that the partition function of the original TQFT becomes just plus one. So that's roughly the, the argument. It's a combination of generalizing of what we usually mean by gauging a one point symmetry to non abelian cases. Okay, maybe, maybe I, I hope that helps, but uh, yeah. It helps a little bit. Can you say a little bit why um, it only has to be positive when this uh, GCD criteria? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I didn't, yeah, I didn't get to that. <laughs> I, I should have mentioned that, yes. So the, the idea is the following. So we have this empty tube anion, which uh, in the condensed uh, matter language is the Lagrangian algebra of this non-abelian TQFT. And it forms a mesh on our three manifolds. And it wraps around various non-trivial cycles in your three manifolds. Okay, so so far there, there's no braiding data entering, right? So I just have the three manifolds and I have this uh, Lagrangian algebra wrapping around different cycles. The, the place where the anions data enter is the following. The three manifold partition functions can be computed using the surgery representation, um, uh, first introduced by Witten and also by uh, Rashtikin and Turaev. The idea is that you can compute the three manifold partition function uh, in, by, by cutting your three manifold into pieces and glue them together. And when you glue them, you have to sum over states uh, uh, on those boundaries. And the states are given, are labeled by the anions data. So, so in, in this surgery representation of the three manifold partition function, if you in addition have this Lagrangian algebra wrapping around different cycles, it ends up being computing the braiding between the Lagrangian algebra and the anions in the surgery representation. Now, you can show that you can raise the, you, originally you have the Lagrangian algebra around each cycle, but you can get the same answer by raising that Lagrangian algebra to the NFS power. This is basically because the anion raised to the NFS and to the NF power is one, so you can, you can raise your Lagrangian algebra to this power without doing anything. But then since these two are uh, co-prime, you can then unwrap the Lagrangian algebra. So in short, it really comes from the surgery representation of the three manifolds and the fact that um, you can unwind. Maybe let me give you one quick intuition. Consider a Z3 gauge theory on the second lens space, namely RP3. A Z3 gauge theory can only have order three holonomy. However, the only non-trivial cycle in RP3 is order two. And so you cannot have any uh, non-trivial uh, holonomies of a Z3 gauge theory on RP3. And that's essentially how the GCD condition comes about. Thank you. Uh, do you have a formula for the partition function on the spherical spaces uh, in terms of the ADE group and the integer M and SNT matrices? Like uh -huh. the oh, almost, group? yeah, almost. So the most general partition functions on the spherical three manifolds, they're all given in terms of this form. All you have to do is to change the exponents here, here is likely. I see. Okay. So, that, so they're all highly computable. Do you have oh. a time to look this up? Uh, sorry to, can I say again? Uh, is there a place to look this up, the exponents you're talking about? Well, actually, oh, I can say a little bit about where the exponents come from. 
oldest appear, um, let's see. Uh, I'm a little bit unsure about the D class, but mo a lot of the spherical three manifolds can be represented as a cipher manifold. And once it's written in terms of the cipher manifold, um, uh, you, you can easily show that this is the partition functions on the cipher manifold. I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I don't. I don't. I don't know if there's a particular reference giving you all, all these answers. We kind of work it out ourselves uh, along the way. But it's based on the existing math literature on the presentation of the spherical three manifold in terms of cipher manifold. 